This is the chapter summary for chapter 15, Electric Fields and Charge Distributions. This is from Matter and Interactions, Wiley Publisher, authors Shabai and Sherwood. Uh, this is just a summary. This is not the whole chapter. So you need to read the chapter, but I'm going to go over the main points. Let, let's just Let's just step back for a second, right? Because remember what we've done so far. We've looked at basically this. I have a, a, a positive charge there. I have a negative charge right there. And I want to find the electric field right there. Well, in order to do that, I need to find the location of that charge, the location of the observation. Let's call that R1. Let's call this ROBS. And let's call this the vector R. R, let's, well, let's just call that R. Then I can find the electric field due to that one charge as E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over the magnitude of R squared R hat. And so R is going to be R O B S minus R1. That's the vector from there to there. Now I can repeat the same thing for this electric field, and I can get the total electric field, let's call that E1. The total electric field is just the vector sum E1 plus E2. Cool? Cool. Okay, chapter 15 is about this to the extreme, right? Because what if I don't have two charges? What if I have three charges or four charges or a billion? Okay, that's what we're going to do. What if we have a billion charges? or more, it will actually be more than that. But they're in some arranged situation that I can, I can manage. So <clears throat> that's what this chapter is about. It's about finding the electric field due to charge distribution. So let's, the first one they start with, and I'm not gonna derive this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you where the ideas come from. The derivation for these I'll make in the separate video. <clears throat> this is a chapter summary, right? It's not the whole thing. So imagine that I have a very thin rod like that. And it has a length L and a total charge capital Q. Now suppose, and this is the y direction, and this is the x direction, and I want to find the electric field right there. There's my observation location. Well, I, I how do if I have uniformly distributed charges over this rod, I could, you know, break it into a billion points and find a billion electric fields and add them up right there. And we will do that with a with a program, but we can do this in another way too, using calculus. And so here's where you actually get to use your calculus. It's going to be great. So the idea is to break this rod into little segments. I can call that charge dq. It's a little piece of the whole thing. And it has a width or length of dy. And it has a, y, a position of y. And this observation location has a position of x. And they're all vectors, and I'm going to write it out better. I'm just trying to get you the big, the big ideas. With that, I can find the contribution of the, uh, this charge produces the, of the electric field at this location. So if that's a positive charge, this distance, like that, and I'm drawing that way too big, but I can call this DE. That's the differential piece of the electric field due to this differential charge. If I can do that, if I can find uh, an expression for the charge, the electric field due to part of the charge, and they're both differentials, I can integrate both sides and then get the total electric field. And that's what we're doing on all these things. Now, there's a bunch of tricks here. In first case, this trick, if we're in the middle right here, I could pick another piece down here that would make a DE that way, and then only the X component would survive. I also need to get dq uh, in terms of dy. So if I assume a uniform charge, and I'm going to derive this fully, so don't worry about that. If I assume a uniform charge over this rod, then I can say dq over q is equal to dy over, over l, right? So the, the ratio of the length to the total length is the ratio of this charge to the total charge. And then so I can get dq in terms of dy. That's important for my integration because I'm going to integrate along y. My integration variable is going to be y. I'm going to be adding up all the pieces along y, not dq. And then I need to find these components. There's a bunch of little tricks there. But once you get done with that, I'm going to write down the, the answer, the magnitude electric field in the x direction. I'll call it ex, um, just because we can talk about that. This is going to be 1 over 4 pi 
epsilon naught q over r times the square root of r squared plus l over 2 quantity squared. That's what you get. That's the x component electric field due to this rod. Okay. Now, you know, you should be able to check things. Does it have the right units? Well, this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught charge over uh, r times r, which is distance squared. That has the same units as a point charge. So that's a good thing. Uh, what happens as l goes to gets really small? As l gets really small, this should look like a point charge, right? So as l gets really small, I, could, I just get r times r and I get r squared. It does go to the equation for electric field due to point charge. What happens as it get really far away? What happens as, uh, this is r, I'm sorry. What happens as r gets really large? Well, this should go to zero, right? You shouldn't have an infinite electric field an infinite distance away. And you can see here, as r gets really big, then this term does go to zero. So those things are all things we can check to make sure that this is a legitimate uh, approximation. Now, we have another value. We can say, what if uh, r is much less than L, so it's very close to that rod, then we get this. E is approximately, the magnitude is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2q over L over r. And you, you know, I can derive that. The next object that we look at is actually quite simple. Um, it's, it's a ring. But it's also very useful. Here's my ring, very thin ring, and it has a radius of, let's say, capital R. And so in this case, I want to find the electric field along this Z axis. So let's call that the X, the Y, and then so Z would be out of the page, and a total charge Q. This one's actually a lot easier, because if you look at it from the side, I have a charge there, and there's my ring. So I cut it in half, and this is the Z axis now. And so this is the distance r, and that's r also, and this is my observation location somewhere over here. But it doesn't matter where I am on the ring, this magnitude of the vector r is constant. So that makes this not too bad of a problem uh, as I break this into little pieces like that. They're all the same distance away, so it, it's actually a fairly easy one. Also, I can use this symmetry down here that says that the electric field up here and down here are going to be in in uh, opposite directions in the xy plane and only the z component will survive. Okay, and again, I'll, I can derive this for you. It's not too difficult. But if you do it, you get a magnitude electric field as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught qz over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. And z is the, the distance along the, the axis of the, of the thing. I do want to point out over here something else I, I didn't mention. And I think it's important for all these situations. When we calculate the electric field here, we get this expression. This is the expression of the electric field, the magnitude electric field, on an axis that splits that rod. If I want to find the electric field over here, it's not trivial by any means. Okay, because now I don't have the symmetry. The integration is really, really difficult. It's a difficult situation. So we solved it for the special case in the middle. Just like over here, we solve for the special case of the electric field on the axis of the ring. If I'm up here, again, it's, it's quite difficult. Okay. It's difficult to do it with calculus. It's pretty easy to do it with, with a numerical calculation in Python, which I'll show you in just a second. I'm not going to do a numerical calculation. I'm going to show you the idea of a numerical calculation. Okay, so that's the electric field due to a ring. It turns out that I can make, if I want to find a solid disk, I can take a disk and split it into a bunch of rings. And if I do that, I can find uh, the charge on this ring, and again, I'm looking at the, the field on the axis, uh, and add up a bunch of rings. Now, each ring, as I move further and further away in the R direction, has a different charge because they're different sizes. But this has a radius of lowercase r and a width of dr, so I can find the area of that and use that to find the charge on that. And, and again, I can go through the details of that, but what you get is the magnitude electric field is q over a over 2 epsilon naught times 1, 1 minus z over r squared plus z squared to the one half. And again, this doesn't really make any sense, right? Um, it doesn't really mean anything until you derive it. We can use that, uh, but 
Oh, I didn't check for the units up here, but this should have the correct units. This is going to be r squared to the 3 halves is going to be r cubed, but then I have a distance on the top too, so I get 1 over r squared. I have the epsilon naught. I have the q, so it works. Uh, you can check other things like what happens as r goes to 0, what happens as z goes to 0. It's fine. Same thing over here. Uh, this has the right units. You can check that. Uh, it looks a little bit more complicated, but it's not too bad. If I'm very close to the disk, then I get E is approximately equal to Q over A, and A is the area of the whole thing. Q over A over 2 epsilon naught, and this is just 1 minus Z over R. And then if I get even closer, very, very close, it's approximately to Q over A over 2 epsilon naught. That's pretty important, and actually you can use this one too, because we can use this for another charge distribution that turns out to be really important, and that's a parallel plate capacitor. So imagine I have two disks right next to each other. They both create an electric field. Uh, if you want to assume they're constant, that's fine, but the electric field inside of here is approximately constant in both uh, constant in both magnitude and direction, and we get the value is approximately equal to Q over A over epsilon naught. So it depends on the charge on here and the size of those, and that's a capacitor. Uh, there is one other problem, and that's a sphere. And it's not trivial to see, but and we talked about this before. The electric field outside of a, of a spherical charge distribution looks just like a point charge. So E is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared, where this is the value of R, not the radius of the disk. The radius of the sphere doesn't even matter. Okay. One more thing. Go back to the rod. Here's my rod, charge Q, length L. I can break this into finite pieces. I can call that delta Y. And then I can calculate uh, the electric field over here due to a finite number of pieces. I'll call that delta E if you want, and add them all up. And this is what we can do numerically. So let's say n equals 10. I can break this into 10 pieces and calculate the electric field. And if we do that, we're just adding up electric fields. We're not uh, integrating. That's nice so we don't have to integrate. But more importantly, if I do my play my game right, I can use the same thing for any position. I could calculate the electric field over here, some off-axis thing, by using a numerical calculation, breaking this into 10 pieces. If I can break it into 10 pieces, I can break it into 5,000 pieces. There's no difference, right? The only difference is with the computer. So that's what we do with a numerical calculation by breaking this into a finite number of pieces and adding them up. Whereas with calculus, we break this into a piece delta y, and we take the limit as that goes delta y goes to 0, and so that we have an infinite number of pieces, and that's what happens when you integrate. So that's the difference between those two, and again, I can show, I'm going to show you that in a later video. I'll show a video where I do both integrate to find the electric field and py use Python to find a numerical version of that all together at the same time, uh, and that will be another video. Okay, the end. Chapter 15, read the book, do the homework, practice problems, the end.